resume with some grounding with Harold. I feel like that's like a grounding, grounding with Harold. <laughs> yes. All right. Sounds good. Go ahead, Harold. All right. So uh, before we start, um, and I will say to like my um, my group, you'll see them up here with me. Uh, the group that up here is actually going to be my direct reports, and so they're the ones that. Um, I interact with on a daily basis. Everyone else is part of the larger leadership directors group uh, that we have in here. Uh, and I asked them to be here today to A, listen to the presentation, uh, hear what you all have to say. So I wanted to start there. Before I get into the presentation itself, uh, you know, we had a conversation regarding my evaluation process how it was going to start. We talked about the grounding session at the end of the evaluation, but before the year started, we all said, let's do that in December. In terms of this year, we think you, we talked about um, really doing it as part of the kickoff for free retreat. And in that conversation, we talked about looking to the future. Uh, what are we doing well? What are we not doing well? What are our challenges? Um, and, and really, you wanted to see what my goals were for the future for the organization and then how we come to an agreement. And one of the things that I talked about in that session is having the ability to having a safe space to speak my truth in terms of what we're seeing operationally. And, um, you know, it was interesting listening to you all in the, the first session about um, team building or group building, depending on the definition that Sal used. Um, and, and so I heard some things on there I will tell you. I'm violating one of my own personal rules, and a rule that I heard you all talk about is a lengthy presentation. And because this is by far the longest presentation I've ever had in my career, but I think it's important. Um, so what I want to do is I kind of went over what we agreed upon as part of my evaluation and how we were going to approach it, and I wanted to really just look to you all and say, is that the agreement that we had in terms of how we were going to kick the year off? Yes. Sure. Yeah, I, okay. uh, yeah. Just one of you, okay. So before we get started, you all did a disc assessment, and um, I wanted to give you some grounding on me. So if you look at D-I-S-C, I've taken this a lot of times, um, and I've taken one that actually does it in a different way. And the way that it does it is it also gives you a tail that tells you where you go under stress. So I have, in a number of occasions, landed kind of in this area right here, as close to dead center as you can probably get through a disc assessment. I have, over time, depending on when I take the disc, will move into something like this. Um, I moved out here when I took it here once, and that was the result was immediately after the flood. And so obviously we're dealing with different issues. But no, this is how I'm going to see the world and, and how I'm going to approach things um, under stress. And some of you all have seen times where I'm under stress. I will operate at the very tip of the peak. They've experienced it at times. To where I just go, I'm done, this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to do it. How I use this, and so I've worked with Riley Harbour for about 20 years. He has a PhD in psychology. Riley and I spend a lot of time talking about how do I use this, how do I learn from it, how do I moderate myself when I'm having conversations, because many of you would probably not expect that I will go that far out in the D range, and that's very intentional. Uh, because that is the work that I'm doing with Riley to moderate myself so I can make sure that they have the freedom and capacity to operate at their highest level. If I'm always out there, they're never going to be able to be creative and operate at their highest level. And so that's pretty intentional in what I do. I also use this, where I have these results for most of the folks in this room. And when I'm interacting with them, I fundamentally change my communication style to match theirs. I don't expect Joni or Valerie to match my communication style. I match theirs because that's going to let them be more successful and, and really make sure that they hear what I'm saying. 
So I wanted you all to hear, see this about me um, because that's going to come into some of this. You're going to see the C, you're going to see some of the D as we talk about some of these issues uh, that we're going through. So let's get off, let's start moving forward. What I hope you hear in this is that the city team is really doing a great job managing our award-winning core services. Um, core services are extremely time sensitive um, and they touch every department that we have. Um, and as we look to more aspirational work, what, what we talk about is we need focus on what those issues are going to be. Um, if we don't have the focus, and, and you'll see this as we're moving through it, if we don't have the focus and we're moving around on a number of issues, that becomes really challenging for us to get anything accomplished because we're constantly ping ponging and we're having to manage the core. Um, you can see what we're going to go over in the presentation. Um, I heard earlier Maslow's hierarchy be brought up. Um, as I have been working with my staff and really looking at what we need to do, what I started finding is that I keep referring to this in my conversations because that is, I think, a good place of where we all know about Maslow's hierarchy, but it's also a really good place for us to transition over to things like core services and the pyramids that you all have seen. And we do have copies of the pyramids. Have we given that? Have we passed that out? Yes. Okay. Way too much information in those pyramids, but it gives you a sense of kind of the nature of the work that we have and we're undertaking as an organization. As I talk to our staff, I go, what's our core purpose? Um, and when you look at this, um, cities are created for these three things, health, safety, and welfare. Um, and those things are rooted in our core services and they really require us to continually focus on those and bring in components of equi equitability and sustainability because the core services are constantly evolving. They're not a static service that we provide. What we did 20 years ago in water and wastewater and electricity is not what we're doing today. And the world is moving really fast around us and, and we have to be in this continual focus that evolves over time. And I want to ask you a question really quick. When you see cities that make the national news, what all do you see? What do you see in terms of why they're making the national news? Negative 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 things happening and mm -hmm. what are issues of health challenges. What are some of the other negative things that you're seeing? They focus on um, ethnic problems rather than solutions for, for the most part. Failures. I mean, it's it's failures on one of those axes. Mm -hmm. And if they're just doing crummy, we don't hear about it. It's, it's like Jackson. It's like Flint. Mm -hmm. You don't hear about them until the failure shows itself. And the failure is always losing sight of what the core function is of a city. And as I was thinking about this and thinking about how we're preparing to go into this, I started thinking back to the goal setting sessions we've had as part of this council, as part of the other councils that work with, outside of it, the councils in San Angelo, the councils in Bubble. And the one thing that really hit me, and you're going to hear me say this over and over again, in all of those cities, when we go into those conversations about what is what are we going to set as goals for ourselves, we never set or, or really highlight core services as being the foundation. We're always looking at what, what's out there in the future, and it's missing. And that takes a really long, a lot of time for us. And that's how we're built from a staffing perspective. Carol, do you, yep. think, do you think that uh, we hear more about cities that have our style of government or commissioner style of government as, as kind of floating? I think where you tend to see the issues really will fall in the strong mayor form because it's hard for those structures. Now I'm talking to you as a public administrator. 
and why we why were we created? Well, we were really created out of the progressive era in the 1920s because of corruption and, and how things were done. I don't think you necessarily see that in the strong mayor form of government today, but what you see is because it's turning over so often that the focus is constantly moving in what they're dealing with and, and in, the, in the council manager form of government. You know, the one thing that you all do have is that I'm going to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. And I think that allows focus to sort of remain on issues. And, and so I really think it's the political dynamic. But you do see it in cities um, that are council manager form of government as well. And uh, I think that's where the collision of the um, politics administrative administration dichotomy really starts moving. Because at the end of the day, I can tell you all what I think. I can give you my professional advice, they can give you their professional advice, but it's your decision. And when you make the decision, we will implement your decision because that's at the core of our ethics. And so when you tend to see that, you will start to see issues. Um, I think it's also at the root of everything that we're seeing in terms of the infrastructure crisis. Every, and, and we're in a really good space. But if you look at, and you'll see some slides and I'll touch on this. So when I look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and you all know this, physiological and safety, that really aligns with core services and what we do. Um, and so what we talked about is, you're now seeing how we're lining up what we do as an organization and, and putting it in comparison to Maslow's hierarchy and you can see that the core services and our operations are really built on those foundational needs in a community. And that probably takes up 85 to 90% of our time and, and what we're having to do. And if you actually look at the urgent and critical, probably 98% of the time, the urgent and critical issues that pop up on us are actually directly related to our core issues. So then we move into community demand and we move into aspirational. So let's talk a little bit about core services. We think this is about 10% of what we do as an organization in terms of the services that we provide. This is just a brief snapshot of everything that we do. Um, and so when we talk about that in terms of core services, you know, this is what's happen happening on a daily basis. What's not on this? is when as directors or um, managers, we have to deal with the personnel issues that are associated with core services. You know, those will take 50 to 60 hours. And so if you have a department that has a couple of those, that's a, a, a significant challenge. The other thing that I realized in this, and I'm guilty of it too, um, is as I'm looking at this and looking at core services, we tend to talk about what we do on a daily basis out in the field. I and, and we probably don't talk about the fact that in terms of our capital improvement plan and what we're doing, the majority of it is actually directly tied to the core services. And that's where we need to do a better job of you know, really talking to the community about what we're doing and what we're seeing. Because if you look at this, you see asset management, you see improving existing infrastructure, and you see new infrastructure, but in that new infrastructure category, it is directly related to what we have to do in terms of the core of what we provide. And we've also seen the consequences of not dealing with that. You know, one of the things that we talked about when I first got here, um, Sandy and I, we were reviewing Focus on Long Bond. It was a great document, and in hindsight, it's always 2020. You have to remember this, but one of the first things when we were looking at what we were doing as an organization, and it said assume um, that all the core services are taken care of. And, you know, so then kept moving down the road, everybody kept focusing on it, but we weren't really making sure the core services were taken care of. And it looks different within the organization. I can look at our utilities and go, we did a great job because they had a really strong capital improvement plan. They were funding those improvements um, in some utilities and other utilities they weren't. That's part of 
when David was hired as the uh, LPC director, I didn't have the same level of capital improvement plan on electric that we did on water, and it's we need to look at this, we need to stop running things into the ground and replacing it, we need to be more proactive in replacing it. So we had areas where we were really strong, we had areas where we could improve, and then we had areas that we can work. And our facilities are probably the prime example of where that occurred. You all know this, you've seen it. Um, we issued, Teresa, how much did we issue in debt for facility improvements? How much did we issue in debt for facility improvements? It's like 20 million, Joni? So around 23 million is what we issued. We got nothing new out of that. We got foundations that were repaired. We got, it was all investment into buildings that you can't see it from the outside. Now, did we extend the life expectancy another 50 years? Yes, we did. But think about if we didn't have to make that investment, how much money may have been available to look at a library annex or look at another recreation center. But all of that was dumped in and just taking care of what we have. And we haven't taken care of everything. Um, I can tell you in looking at the public safety building, that number keeps growing and growing and growing because every time we take something apart, we find something that's worse. And, and so that is what I really wanted to talk about because, and you all said it earlier, um, Flint, Jackson, any city that you've seen a bridge collapse, that's what hits the national news. You don't see the aspirational things hit. And what flips communities, is, and you all may not agree with this, but where I've seen flips in communities is when you have failure there, that is so foundational that they completely react and everything that you were working on that may have been at the top level of this pyramid, people forget about and they actually start going, why are you spending your time on this? We have these foundational issues. Deal with it. I've seen councils flip on this um, and you lose a lot of progress in what you're trying to do holistically. So what What's impacting our efforts? Economic uncertainty. Uh, we have a new WTF, and it's what's the forecast? Recession, no recession, we don't know. And there's not an economist out there that can really give us an answer. I asked Valerie, and I want to thank Valerie for helping with this PowerPoint. She would sit and listen to me talk, and then take these things and distill it down, and and trying to keep me focused, but, so thanks Valerie, but the one thing that I can tell you that we all have to come to grips with, and, and it's hard for a lot of us because we all are, have some degree where we're control freaks, um, is I think the only certainty is that there is uncertainty, and we're gonna have to embrace the lack of control because the markets are pushing us in ways that we have never seen. Um, for those of you all that have um, council members that sit on our investment oversight boards, you've seen some of this. This was, I think, the first time that ex equities and fixed assets, in terms of an investment perspective, both went negative. You know, in most cases, when you try to diversify your economic portfolio, you want to split those two because when equities are positive, fixed assets are down, and, and it, by both were down double digits. Um, what we also saw in this is that um, equities went through their second bear market in three years. And um, the bond market sold off the most that they have in 100 years. So that, that is a lot of uncertainty that is really building into the system that our folks are having to deal with on a daily basis. Is it a headwind or a tailwind? Depends on your perspective. So. This was done by the Leeds School of Business, and they talk about tailwinds are employment growth, wage growth, consumption, retail sales, income growth. It is. And it's a tailwind in terms of our tax revenue that we receive. It's also a headwind for us in that all of those things are pushing us because it is making it harder to hire people. We're having to pay people more. 
you all approved in this budget cycle the largest increase I think we have ever made in this organization. I'm looking at the historical folks. I, Teresa. It's up there. If it's not the largest, it's close. The market was driving that. And so what happened is that starts constricting the financial resources that we have to do other things that we've talked a lot about it. But again, this is about uncertainty. This is about, is it a headwind? Is it a tailwind? It depends what lens you're using. So we may take more tax dollars in, but if the headwind has a larger impact than the tailwind, then we're not taking in enough revenue to you know, offset what the headwind is. And, and that's a challenge that we're, we're gonna continue facing. This sort of goes a little bit further, but what it also tells us is that the uncertainty in the labor market's gonna remain. I don't know if you all saw this, um, Home Depot budgeted a billion dollars this year that goes solely into compensation. And so now, Home Depot, if you go to McDonald's, I'm a McDonald's fiend, you will see one day it was $15.50, then it was $16, and now I think it's $17 that they're posting for jobs. Those That's placing pressures on many of our positions. So what the CEOs are telling us is, yeah, I expect this to continue. Um, again, this is something you all may have seen from the Lee School of Business. Um, what we're really talking about here is that a lot of what I'm telling you today is not unusual and we're not different than most of the cities in terms of what our concerns are. Where we are different is when you look at things like, so obviously inflation, the tight labor market, we all have the same views, but when, when we look at affordable housing, I will tell you based on the policy decisions you made, we are further along than most communities. Are we where we need to be? No, but we're moving. Um, unfunded street, we do have gaps in our street fund, but not gaps that other communities are seeing. So when I look at this piece, I go, yeah, we're in pretty good shape, not at the same level, but it's still a concern for us. Long-term concerns, water needs. I was in a meeting with Dave Hayes and who, what was that? Oh, it's for, uh, Ray Petros. Ray Petros. The deans of water law in the state of Colorado. And they go, we tell everyone that Longmont has the best water system in the state of Colorado. And so we don't have that same worry that other communities do. Um, and there's positive, I think we talked about that. And I will tell you all, I knew this was gonna, I can see the look on faces. And so I'm watching this, there's, there's good things to come too. Um, but I wanted to frame it out because that's what these folks are dealing with on a daily basis. Um, and, and you'll see where we're going to pull this um, back around. So now for some good stuff. What's working? Um, I'm not going to read all of these. This is a snapshot of what this organization's done, what everyone that I'm looking at back here has really done for our community. And that's a pretty hefty list. And we are lucky to live in a community and work in a community where we really have this partnership and we have the staff that we have that can produce these types of results in really trying times. Uh -oh. What's working with staff? This is really interesting to me. Um, we have an employee advisory group that they are self-regulating, self-selecting, and I meet with them on a monthly basis and they did this survey and uh, we never, as leadership, touch the survey. We don't see the responses. We only get the aggregate results. And that's important for me because I don't want people think, to think that we're trying to hit a certain conclusion. So the good news in this is that overall, over 88% of our staff feel generally satisfied. Here's why I was shocked by this. This was not a random survey. This was a self-selected survey. And so typically when you see self-selected surveys, you're expecting different results because that's typically where you're going to hear where people are unhappy because they can do it. Now, are we great? Absolutely not. But I will tell you, I was pretty happy when I saw this and I think everyone in this room should be because that's a testament to their work. 
do we see areas? Yes, the red is where they're extremely dissatisfied. Obviously, you see it in other. That's expected. Um, but when you look at it by years of service, this was something that I was also really glad to see, is that you're not seeing differences in terms of tenure. And so that's really good. And I think that's a part of what we all do collectively, the city council and the operations, is, is really work to, to have that type of scenario. Our residents. So you all saw the Leading Way Award. Um, that award actually, for me, um, means a lot more because it's not an award that we go out and apply for and you know we're sending this huge application as to why we're great and we, we should receive this award. This was directly related to what the residents were saying about our community. And um, what they do is they basically look at every city they survey and they say who's in the top 10% and it's just based on your performance. So this is really good. So what are our challenges as we, as we look at some of these things? Um, finance and operations, you all have seen this rising capital cost. Um, you know, it's interesting that not only is it rising capital cost, but when you look at the inflationary factors that are coming in and the interest rates continuing to move up, what that does is when you do issue debt in an in a interest, high interest rate environment, you can actually do less with the money than you originally planned to, to, um, to do and combined with rising capital costs is why I went to you all and said we've got a $14 million gap on this list of capital projects. Um, and then connected to both of these are supply chain threats. It takes about, Daryl, a year to get a transformer now. Is Daryl here? Uh, yeah, take off. And take off, but I yeah, it, it can take off. Yeah, it can take that. And we manage that really well, but there are other communities that are placing holds on development or running generators out to get some folks online. Costco's a good project. We actually had to have an in-depth conversation because they couldn't get the switch gear that they needed that was going to delay them months and we had to work on what's an acceptable switch gear to replace it because of that. Um, here's where a lot of my focus is really starting to go. So our labor market and the dynamics that we're seeing. What you're seeing in this is both numbers. Um, uh, in terms of unemployment, 3.4% and nationally 2.8% in Colorado, those are extremely unhealthy unemployment numbers. A healthy unemployment number tends to be around 5%. And so what that's telling us is um, there's not a lot of applicants here. Combine that with people are opening more jobs, the people are paying more, and there are more jobs than people that are unemployed. Uh, the uh, State demographer said the other day, for every two jobs, there is one applicant. And, and again, that's something we can't control, but it's something that we have to understand and deal with. Over 60% 60, 60 of employees are considering a job change. You know, we're starting to see this, and it's related to other things, but within the last two weeks, um, we've seen different people move. <coughs> and choose other jobs and and why they're doing it is very personal and you're going to see some other labor information but typically it's i'm can work closer to where i live i have more flexibility i mean those things are starting to hold true when we see folks move which is connected to the housing market um and i've talked about some of this the one thing i wanted to point out is, is we are a staff intensive organization if you think, remember when we talked about this with the general fund, 70% of what we do is actually by the people, by people. And it changes when we get into our utilities where you see a lot of capital dollars come, come into play, but the reality is they're not staffed at a really high level. And so you still have, they have to design the projects, they have to bid the projects, they have to do all of those things. And so, they don't, we don't have the volume of staffing. And while capital is a big part of the budget, it's still human-centric in what we do. And why the uh, labor issues are something that I've been focusing, or that we've been focusing on in terms, and you've heard um, workforce of the future, you heard, you know, you approve the budget, but this is all there. We're just now actually getting to pre-recession staffing. And I'm talking the 08 Great Recession. Um, 
And this is an example of what we're seeing uh, when we're trying to um, work with our staff. I told, I think it was Council Member Waters, when they were talking about sports, and I said, as a city manager, I feel like a college coach with the new NIL rules um, because, you know, they recruit someone and then they have to keep them there because of all the uh, folks trying to get them. That's what we feel like today. This goes back to the EAG survey, and you see the compensation was really high on this. Now, here's the interesting piece. The survey was actually, and they intentionally did this release prior to we brought our budget proposal to you with the large compensation increase. So we're actually intrigued with um, what it's going to look like next year because they got, you know, we had a 6% minimum and we capped out at 12%. Correct, Teresa? Sandy, 6 and 12? And so that's a pretty hefty increase. So we're going to. Really be interesting to see what that looks like, but where you see the arrows, those are things that have really drawn my attention. Um, we've talked about league policies, mental and physical wellness. Not only is this something we're seeing here, we're actually seeing it nationally in terms of how people are responding to work and what's really becoming a dissatisfier for people in jobs. Susie and I were talking about this in a break in that the more you vote on folks, and if you can't fully staff because you can't um, hire people, and the more people are absorbing, the more mental and physical wellness really starts coming into play. And if you're, the bulk of your work is 75% of your general fund budget is people, <coughs> we need to pay attention to that. And you see it start translating into work life balance and workplace flexibility. Um, kind of going back to this, uh, I think, you know, we talk about this and, you know, the world's changed, it'll never go back. And COVID was a big part of this. Everyone wanted workplace flexibility pre-COVID. Everyone wanted to work from home and do these things as industry, uh, whether it's private or public, we were all reluctant to do it because we didn't think it would work. COVID proved that it would work. And so those expectations aren't going to change. We have different, gen is that a later slider? We have different jobs passing we did. We have different generations coming into the workforce that actually think differently about work. Um, Council Member Martin and I talked about this in, so my mom's 92 years old. I'm actually carry a lot of characteristics of a baby boom person. And so how I see work is much different than someone who is a Gen Xer that I went to school with. I carry some of those tendencies, but what we're finding as we look through the generations of X, Y, Z, millennial, so on and so forth, they don't see work as something core that we have to do. It is a part of their life, but it is not all of their life. And, and when, when you understand that, for us as managers, we're having to reconcile that because they'll up and leave if they feel like they're not in, able to really have this outside life. And, uh, and I can tell you, we see it all the time. Our resident expectations, um, you know, you all see this. Um, our, our residents are, you know, routinely coming to council about asking you to do any number of things. I think, all, you know, there's a part of it where we have to get better because I think there's a confusion about who owns what. Is it a city? Is it the county? Is it the state? We often hear this. And we're having to answer, well, this isn't us, this is them. But I think even when they come to you all with issues of what their expectations are, they're bringing things that where there's inherent tension in play. And I'll talk about the top two when you look at affordable housing programs and preservation of natural areas. There is a tension point there. Because we all know that in order to really make a dent affordable attainable, you need to build. But if you're, if you're managing this, and I, we realize that that puts you all in a really hard position because those are some core values in the community. But this on top of the core work that we have to do, um, you can start seeing where the layering is starting to occur in terms of capacity. And, you know, I think of uh, the staff in this room, at, just like I think of, in my mind, it's financial capacity, it's human capacity. Those two are main drivers in how we can perform and what we can do. 
So then we come to the pyramid. Um, we talked about this earlier. You all see the full list of the pyramids. What really hit us when we were talking about is if you look at what, in some cases, staff has put up here in the aspirational piece, are actually core services. How do we develop the analytics so that we can expand our core in an efficient, effective way? But it's aspirational for us because we don't have the time to deal with some of these issues. And so we, we, we say they're aspirational for us, but they're really foundational for the organization. Core things that start in the aspirational category will move down into the core. So as we talk about the goal for 100% renewable electricity, the work of that has quickly dropped into core services when you think of what we're doing with AMI and how that has to be a foundational piece in order for us to really hit the 100% renewable. It's not, we, we have dropped that down pretty quickly because we can't do that without this. And so you see how things will move from top to the bottom in terms of core. And, um, and you see that. We also have to deal with challenges and disruptors and emergencies. Um, so you know a little bit about me when we say our plan. I don't typically plan that way. I typically go into if A happens, then B, C, or D can happen. I'm not limited to just B. I'm going B, C, or D, and then whatever happens and we move, and we're jogging. Here's our reality on a daily basis in terms of this. And, and we put this in to really talk about it because I also realized as I was preparing this presentation, um, there wasn't a council member that was here, um, here sitting on the council in the club here. And we have new council members and you haven't seen some of the things that we've been going through and dealing with. And so we wanna kind of do a, a quick update. So when you look at this, you know, we can talk about core services, urgent, critical demand, aspirational. Uh, but we, we constantly deal with major, minor disruptors. You heard me say earlier when we talked about the Great Recession that we haven't necessarily recovered from that. We're just now getting to the staffing levels that existed prior to the Great Recession. What's interesting about this is the more we get into it, um, Teresa was on one of the interview panels that I was on, and we spent some time in that talking about this section in the budget that talked about the budget gap, which was ongoing operations that were funded by one-time dollars. So we started working on that in 2012, to talking to council about how we need to fin fill this gap. We thought it was about $3 million. It turned out being closer to $4 million. So we had to put $4 million to cover ongoing expenses that didn't shift the needle. It was just paying for what we're already doing. It hasn't been until the last two to three budget years where we could actually make concerted efforts to adding bodies to the budget um, to, to compensate for the increased level of work, which we're talking about the core areas. And talking to Sandy, some things that we saw were we didn't make distinctions during um, after 08 in terms of what positions were cut. The positions that were cut were just positions that were vacant. And, and so you had some areas that were really foundational that lost positions just because somebody wasn't in there. And, and, and so what I can tell you all, we ever get in that situation again, you're gonna clearly hear you know, what I, how I think we should move through this. Um, a year and a half later, we have another major disruptor, which is the flood. You know, when we talk about the parks projects, Joni and I have had this conversation. I can't really explain what happened the 10 years prior to the flood. Uh, but what I can tell you is when the flood hit, we had to completely reposition ourselves. Um, Joan, I think, came on the council shortly after we were in the budget. But we literally had to walk in on the Tuesday after the budget and tell the council, we're not going to present our capital improvement plan to you. We have to completely change it because we had to rebuild things that we thought we were never gonna to have to touch. We had to completely redesign Dickens Park because the river changed its course. And, and so we had to completely shift ourselves here to deal with the recovery work because we were also on a time limit based on the federal funds. Um, 
then we kind of are continuing to plug through flood recovery, of which we're not done with. Um, we're still doing it. And then we hit the pandemic. I, I have been here 11 years. Uh, I have only been here a year and a half where there hasn't been a major disruptor that, is in, that has impacted us or continued to impact us. Not to mention the minor disruptors of when we created the neighborhood impact team and what we were seeing in Lanyon Park or public safety issues. You know, we had the issues where we had the shooting in our community. Those are minor disruptors that we're having to completely react to because they're embedded within the core services. And then I wanted you all to see this in terms of how emergencies in my mind sit. Um, immediate emergencies are those things that immediately threaten the core services that we're here to provide. And then I start working through near-term, mid-term, long-term. And that's really based on what's hitting us at this point in time. Um, you all know this. We've absorbed the housing authority. We're trying to figure out affordable housing. We're trying to uh, figure out attainable housing. And the thing that hit me on this, and, and I've talked to some of you all about this, is you know, this is a project that is not done just by Molly and Herb. This is a project that is absorbed by the entire organization. Those of you that are in here that have, are working on affordable housing, can you raise your hand? And some of you aren't, because Jim is, David is. I know they are because they're working on the fee structures and everything else. We literally have every division in the organization moving into the affordable and attainable housing conversation. So, we've talked about disruptors, we've talked about emergencies, we've talked about those things. Um, if you looked at disruptors and emergencies, what comes to your mind as council? I think uh, just just thinking about the Marshall fire. That's a huge, been a huge disruptor for us. The staff, what two months? Our staff piggybacked from yep. here to Louisville and Superior, or working both cities. Um, that was a major disruption. And because of that, not just that fire, but ongoing, we have migration, population migration, people trying to find homes all over the place, which adds to our police policing and our homelessness, and it all piggybacks like dominoes. Piggybacking on that, it's the thinking of how do we deal with uh, uh, what they're trying to come up with that solutions for new development there in those communities and put in the sprinkler systems and things like that. We go down that path, which obviously people would say, well, it hasn't happened here, so why are you worried about it? But it almost happened here the year before that, so that's a major issue. I hope it's not too abstract, but we're in a situation where um, I, th I think because they have a different understanding of sustainability than we do, the public does not see some of the things the city inside, in this room, feels that it needs to do as critical and therefore opposes it. Like growth at all. Susie? Okay. Kim? Uh, <clears throat> well, what the first thing that occurred to me was the state legislature, frankly, um, and, and what, what they do that impacts public safety or you know, other policy decisions. We make. And I know these are good people trying to do the right thing, but it, right. but it, is, it is not without consequence. In the, world. the other is just <clears throat> Uh, since we're talking about aspirations, uh, segments of our community appropriately having aspirations for the city, right, for their interest and for us to deliver on those interests up against <clears throat> the demands of, of, on the city and the staff on core services. And we get kind of caught up 
and some of those are in the middle of those, you know, as elected officials. But when I think about, I'm one of those who've advocated, pressured maybe, that we clarify what we ought to put on a ballot this fall, right? good, bad, or otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, that's somewhat fueled by expectations or aspirations. And I can, I can, and I can see where so in this room, people might be looking at whatever comes of that as, as ne the next big uh, distractor or disruptor in terms of functions of the city. Well, that's interesting. The way we actually were able to come at it is we were able to minimize that a little bit because we put the ongoing costs, we put, you know, we're going to fund project management out of So that I, I is a that. slightly different one, but when we don't have that where we can build it in and then we have to do it, then yeah, it's square on us. I'm more, con my thought is more about the community expectations right. and the segments that want to see fill in the blank and are going to be real disappointed if they if we don't deliver. Right. Shakita? Well, I think of the challenges um, more so than than um, disruptors and in emergencies. That's exactly what they are. You just never know what may happen. But challenges, I think, of, I look at how we have a, a growing senior population and how are we accommodating that population. Um, you know, we do have, you know, the housing issues and homelessness issues. Um, growth, you know, how are we accommodating the growth responsibly, right? And, um, and can that be a disruptor with our plans, all of our plans, our vision, and all that, so. And we know we're gonna grow, we wanna grow, but at what pace can we um, expect that growth? You know, maybe triple what we expect. safe to see who was out the door earlier for last. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, you know, a lot of it has been touched on through previous slides and through the comments of the other council members. Uh, one thing I see is disruptor or maybe um, maybe a different term being a distractions mm -hmm. are the, the nature of our 24-hour news cycle and whatever the fresh outrage of the day is. Um, that's hard to keep up with and can distract us from keeping, you know, focused on our our plans and our ideas and our goals uh, when we have to address every little thing that, you know, might be going on in the current culture wars um, politically or whatever that happens to be, like I said, 24 hour news cycle, whatever the new outrage is, can really uh, take us off course in front of that at times. Yeah. 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 Well you know what's interesting that we talk about internally is I think we also become our own disruptors. And I'm talking about operation from staff. I'm not going to put you all on the spot, but you all can think about it. But when I look internally, how we can be our own disruptors, we've made structural adjustments to try to address that. And so one that we've made um, is that when we have any kind of project or engagement, uh, that is going to impact the neighborhood. The first conversation I want 
is to go into Carmen's group, Community and Neighborhood Services. Because I, what I found is when we don't do that, um, we create a poop storm of biblical proportions, and we end up spending 300, 400 hours trying to put Pandora back in her box when it could have been completely avoided. And so that is an example of when I look internally at what we do operationally of that self-created disruptor that totally derails us from what we're working on and what we need to do. And so um, what I would say is you all can think about that and go, what do you see in terms of disruptors like that? Can I say there's a metaphor for this going on right now? What's that? <laughs> I'm working real hard and stay focused on it. <laughs> yeah. Is it like the afternoon concert? <laughs> <laughs> but it's a perfect metaphor from a screaming baby to a. <laughs> You're right. You're right, because I'm starting to go to the plane because I have a son that's a, a musician. And, um, so, in this, how do we overcome these challenges? You, you know, what you will see from me, and you probably. Um, the core of me, there's there's an internal optimism that I'm always balanced with the brutal truth of what we're dealing with. And my wife criticizes me about this all the time, and she's like, well, you're not positive. And I'm like, no, I really, I am, and I know we can do this, but here's the brutal truth. And I went back last night, and I really looked at the Stockdale Paradox, which is in good to great, which is the probably the best example of, of how I approach the world. I know we can do it and we can get it done, but I'm not blindly going in there. I know there's going to be some really hard spots as we do it. And are you all familiar with the Stockdale Paradox? So um, Admiral Stockdale was a, a prisoner of war in Vietnam, and he survived years in a prisoner of war camp, and many of the people that were in there didn't. And so as part of that work, they asked him, well, why did you survive, and why did the person next to you not survive? Because they both had optimism that they were going to get out. The people that didn't tend to, tended to think they were going to get out immediately, they were going to be saved, you know, it wasn't, and he knew it was going to be a long road, and he would have to endure a lot of hardship. And what, what they were finding is that people like that, we're the ones that tended to survive. Is that a, I know you know. Yeah, it's what comes comes to my mind is in the kind of the, the cliche or the, you know, the one sentence is facing the hard realities without giving up. Right. Mm -hmm. Without and persisting. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what we've done today. We're kind of saying, here's the hard realities. Here's what's facing us. We can't give up. We can't give up as staff. We can't give up as teammates. Because I will say there is a team component now team component between the city council and staff. We just have to be, we have to moderate, understand what we're doing, and you're going to see kind of what you all ask for. What do I need from you all? Um, this is important to, to me, to us. Um, I actually, um, we were debating on who it was attributed to, and obviously there's a bunch of people, but you know, something that, that, I, that we talk about is those who stand for nothing fall for everything. And, and you know, and, and you're hearing me say, what, what do I stand for? I stand for really good core services, providing for the most basic needs of the community. And, and you all have started to hear me say this. I don't have capacity. I don't do these things. You know, we're struggling because that's the core of what we have to do. Now I stand for other things too, but every city I've worked in, multiple managers that I've talked to, when we talk about where we can tend to get off kilter, is where we don't really identify what we stand for and we're trying to do everything and we're not good at everything. Um, and that's what we have to worry about because you know I can push too, that D tendency, I, I don't have patience, I don't do things. And, I can derail them pretty fast too. They're really good about telling me you're derailing us, and um, and that's a good thing. But I have to manage myself a little bit. Valerie's really good at it. She can talk about her. <laughs> she can talk about her camera um, debates. Um, so what do we need from council? 
Um, you know, the first thing, shocking. I think as we're looking at the, the goals for next year and in the future, um, how do we recognize core work and how do we incorporate that into what we're doing? Um, so it is front and center for all of us. Um, really provide the what, the policy, the clear direction in terms of what we need. Um, an understanding of the disruptive occurrences and what that really means for us and that we may be going down this road but this disruption is, disruption is so significant. We are having to shift the organization over um, to, to deal with this, um, saw a clear direction. How do we stay focused on our goals and understanding the impacts of adding project midstream and what that really does to the goals that we're talking about? Um, permission to stop doing some things, and I'll tell you, we struggle mightily with this internally in that we've gone through budgets and these folks can look at me and I'll go, tell me what we're gonna stop. I don't get stop list. And, and so that's our conversation in, in that they have heard me now start talking about have to, need to, want to. Have to, need to, want to. And sometimes when I get stop lists, they're have tos. That's how organizations work. I've seen it every place I've been in. We need to get better at this, but I think we also need permission to stop doing some things if we want to focus on other things. And then uh, support and discipline. You know, and support for me is really important, especially in this time. We all, we've all touched on it. I think Aaron said it multiple times throughout this meeting, is that the world has changed so dramatically and the vitriol that we're experiencing from the community as a level is at a level that we've never seen. Um, we've talked about it. I've been very open to say, if I were starting my career today, my aspiration would not be, to, would not I would not aspire to be a city manager. I would not want to do it. It is that different in terms of what people are having to deal with. Um, <coughs> it is a crisis in our profession. City managers are retiring left and right. There's openings left and right. They're going through multiple recruitments. We're seeing it. It's just because the way people are communicating with each other, and this is part of that disruptor from the national level, is. People think it's really okay to just say and do whatever they want to any one of you there on the city council or any one of us. And it's really diminishing the applicant pool that we have coming into it. And it's a major topic. If you look at the ICMA magazines, it's like every month they're talking about this. And so I think that's where we need the support. We really need the discipline in terms of when we set the goals, how are we focusing on those, understanding how it relates to core services. Do you think you're on this? They're willing to say that those things to your face or is it the convenience of social media and email? All of the above. Okay. I literally, um, in our utility billing department, it is not uncommon for us to have issues where somebody will not want to talk to a uh, Hispanic staff member. Um, I take those calls. I personally take those calls when I know about them because they're going to have to talk to me. Yeah. You know, and these folks see it all the time. Code enforcement officers just have to go out and have police presence with them because of how people are acting. Meter readers that engage in different levels. Our next line employees, you know, and it's just, it's, it's the new world. And um, when we look at the hiring challenges and all of those other things, you can see the, the layering of how the world has changed for the profession that we chose. What's our commitment to you? Um, be more efficient. And, and you're seeing where we're driving some of those aspirational goals down. Uh, when we talk about um, Becky's group and strategic integration, there is a reason I moved that out of the utility sector and into the internal service sector. Um, and that is because they are providing support to, they're gonna be providing support to the entire organization in terms of how we then make data-driven decisions or use data as part of our decision-making process. Not every decision can made, be made solely by data. There are other things that come into play that we have to take into account. Um, if you see me kind of moving to the middle, you're seeing some I and S coming out of me to go, there's a human element of this that we need to be cognizant of. 
greater accountability for you all, a mechanism for reporting progress. We're, we're in the stages of developing dashboards that will look different operationally for everyone. So the immediate director may have a more robust dashboard. It'll work itself up to where I'll have one and then we'll have one that you all can do. So we're starting to, to build that um, within the time that we have. Um, centers of Excellence, that's one that you all have heard me talk about. Uh, that is something that when we look at Langdon Park, I mean, LHA is the best example of where we did it accidentally. It was just an accidental center of excellence, but it got us thinking about it. But when you look at what we've done at Langdon Park in terms of the center of excellence in that, that is another example where I think every division is represented. Every division is part of the solution. Um, we completely flipped the, um, uh, the hierarchy in that Carmen and Sarah Arney lead it. I work for Carmen and Sarah Arney when they're doing these things. And they tell us what they need. It is, it is flipping um, the management profile because they know what's going on. I, I don't know what's going on there. They're the experts. Um, and what they were able to do in the amount of time that they did it was really fast. And so when you bring that center of excellence component in, you're able to really move quickly and be more nimble. Um, that has now grown into where it's really a center of excellence for the um, neighborhood impact team to where they're now looking at neighborhood issues generally and they have a process now of when does it go into the, the center of excellence team, when does it stay within the department, how do we advise you. And so what we're finding is when we have these neighborhood issues develop, they're on them fast and it's not taking the time that it took us to deal with Langdon Park. And so that's an example. And then we're all going to ensure that we're listening and communicating with you, with council and the residents as we continue to move forward. So you all wanted to see what was my focus as an organization, and you're going to see where I was touching on these issues. The operational piece, obviously the unyielding focus on core services, uh, addressing staffing challenges in labor market, data-driven decisions and project management. What's not on here that should be, but is always in there is, is you know, financial integrity to the, to the system. Um, housing, um, LHA affordable and attainable, equity and sustainability, climate action, um, steam, downtown area, sugar mill. Um, that's an interesting one because that's one where you also have to accept no control in this or lack of control because it is so dependent on the private sector to, to come into play. And, and so when we talk about this area, you know, we were really focused on steam in the downtown, but, you know, we're working on something with the sugar mill because the private sector came out and said, we're here. And so you're fundamentally dependent on this. And we can spend a lot of time working on an idea. And at the end of the day, if it doesn't pencil financially, they're out. And then you're, you're looking for another partner. Um, Transportation and early childhood. You have seen these in the budgets that we've been bringing to. Every year we're bringing, you know, the last couple of years you see big allocations in this. And, um, and what we did is we took your old master plan and said, here's what's in that. We then said, how is it aligning with this? Um, so, that's my presentation. What did you all hear? What do you think? It's now time for a more open conversation based on what I presented. Is this what you wanted to hear? Is this not what you wanted to hear? Is this what you want out of this kind of session? Well, I would just say that I think it really illustrates and drives home the amount of effort and resources it takes just for core services, right? And that should, as a council, as we set policy, uh, should you know instruct us a little bit on how much capacity there is for some of our more aspirational goals mm -hmm. and understanding that maybe we have to prioritize our aspirational goals as well, you know? And maybe check off some boxes before we can start a new project with you. So, oh. I'm gonna go get my. I'm listening. I'm gonna go get my. Silly buddy. 
from the council's duties thing that we have got to find a way to get better at, which is articulating what we what we intend as policy decisions better. Because you know so many times we find that the staff does not have know how to act on our intent or we all walk away with different ideas of what intent is and 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 that's on us you know we have to we have to get better and i think some of the things that we brought out of this morning are at least a hope for that but in terms of what do we want i'm uncomfortable with the aspirational thing because to me, almost everything that's at the aspirational point now is going to do what you said and fall down into core services so fast it's going to make our heads swim. And sustainability will be compromised if we don't accomplish that. So therefore, it's hard for me to um, think in terms of, of what not to do. It's, it's so hard to find aspirational things that are really truly disposable. If I can jump in, and, and it may not be what not to do, it may be elongating the time frame. Prioritizing. Or, or prioritizing when we do this. And you're kind of taking me into what we're going to talk about tomorrow, but it, it really is, at the end of the day, whatever you come up with, if it's the same set of prop goals or, or whatever you're doing is, is then prioritizing one, two, three, four, five. So when there's tension, we know which one we need to focus on. But time could be a, a really, you know, the optimism. The answer may just be elongating the time frame. Could you go back a slide? So <clears throat> it'd be not today necessarily, but as we think about whether it's goal setting or priorities among goals or within goals. And was your, was your rubric uh, have to, need to, want to? That's part of what I look at. Well, is that in, in yes, terms of what, in my mind, the budgeting in my, process? Yeah. For those, was that the rubric? That's, that's always And I understand what you typically give up in a conversation about organized abandonment is the conversation about organized abandonment, mm -hmm. right? It just never goes anywhere because people aren't willing to give much up unless it's the have to, right? But it would be helpful to me if, if even in the, if these are your priorities, what are the have to want to need to want to here, right? Because um, some of that maps right on to previous council work. I can we go go back to that slide where you had asked the, at the pyramid that cut across to, to departments. Right, and what their aspirational goals are, and how they, you know, and, and what shows up at, at levels. I mean, we could work off of either one of those as far as I'm concerned, but I'd be satisfied to, to, to learn more about what are the aspirations here and, and to formulate, you know, to get clear on priorities and formulate goals around here. If those are the things you know that we need to do, you can't get some of that done probably without us, or at least no. us being really smart about we are, what we are or not doing. That's, for me, uh, that I, I would start to dig in right here. So part of, you know, so the rubric, if you don't mind me kind of no, no. turning off of this, and you go, housing have to? Yeah. Housing have to. Housing impacts our labor market. Why we don't people get people applying for jobs is because of the housing expense. We've talked about it. If Take my hiring process and fast forward it to today. And I'm looking at a market, and I'm looking at this housing market, and I'm like, holy smokes, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to actually lose on that deal. Nothing you all are doing, it's just the, the housing market. So it imp impacts the employment base. It impacts diversity in our community, which is incredibly important because that's what makes Longmont Longmont, is the diversity in our community. 
it impacts our educational system if we can't get teachers in and then teachers are having to draw drive from literally my kids teachers Denver it's almost Wyoming the danger to economic development is far greater than any of this because we're depending on the businesses that are here and those businesses when we have economic development conversations sit here and go what's your labor market that's the first question they ask Sometimes we don't even see them if they don't think the labor market's great. And we know that the labor market's being impacted by housing. I used the example with them when Honda left California and they went to, they ended up locating in Texas and the world, you know, the language was they bought. They were going to leave because the labor market was out of control, housing was out of control, they couldn't get people to work in their plants. They just went out and made other cities compete to see who's going to bring it in. That's the have to in this is because there are so many things that it impacts. And at the end of the day, 10, 15 years from now, it really impacts the viability of our community. Because if we start losing businesses and employers because we don't have housing, that's going to impact our tax base and that's going to impact the services that we can provide. So that's why you have to. Same with equity and sustainability because you're seeing so many of the funding sources coming in, attaching those components to it, and to be the best organization and community we can be. We have to embrace those concepts because that's also going to really hit at who's wanting to come and work for us. And, and, and so all of these, you know, the only one where I could say, mm, it's not necessarily a have to, but I think it touches each one of these is maybe the steam downtown sugar mill, but it touches housing, it touches all of these things, and it diversifies our economic base in a way that provides us protection against future downturns. Yeah, well, at some point, that would be fun to, to drill down even on that. What's the have to there in terms of a, a, a really compelling vision mm -hmm. as opposed to just be passive and hope somebody comes along with a proposal, but, to, but have a vision out there so that you know, potential investors or participants would know what we're looking for, you know, where those alignments are. And actually, I think the work that we did, we're seeing that. COVID just disrupted everything yeah. in the financial models because people are referring to it as we're talking to them. It's about financial capacity. I will tell you, I think the work that we need to figure out is the horizontal infrastructure component to this because that is probably what's hitting everything. Just like on the sugar mill, What's hammering that is the environmental cleanup, and it's expensive, and and so we can do that. But and early childhood is a have to because of the employment base. It's all layers. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope I answered. So, I hope sorry, I gave you all some more information. No, I hope I gave you all some more information. Okay. So as you were going through the slides, and you're saying, "What do you want from council? What does council want from us?" Uh, when we get um, council comes on a new project that's coming in, a new development, housing or whatever, we always get on how this links to Envision Walmart, you know, to the goals and the, uh, where we want to go. For me, it would be really helpful and maybe to give this input to you as well as we bring in projects or things that we want done. How does this affect core services? Which then we can link a timeline to. Because the STEAM project is huge, but we know it's going to take forever. I mean, this is not a five-year project. Um, so how is that going to affect the core services? And do we give you the flexibility to say we need to stop on this? Um, because we have this, we have absolutely have to address. I know that's not going to make the investors happy, but as a city, how much can we really undertake? And I think from my standpoint, that's what we need from you, is that when, when a project comes to us, how is this going to affect your core services? Do you have the bandwidth for it? Because it's hard to make policy when we don't want the flexibility mm -hmm. on you and staff. I'm waiting because Go for it, Marcia. people have, have spoken. In, in some of the things, the things at the bottom um, are
are are kind of an amenitization thing in in the I I keep I wish you had a slide of of the Pruitt-Igo housing development falling to the ground as they imploded the building because we're in this situation of growth you know infill in order to meet our housing needs and and the infrastructure teams that are at the top of this but for livability and sustainability the things at the bottom of the list are are critical or or you get into this you know uh, dystopian vision of, of a, a soulless city and is there a way that that the focus on some of these things at the bottom can be turned like by privatization so that it puts less burden on the staff yeah and I think those are things we're going to talk about tomorrow and we have some oh. questions for you all that, that really get at some of these you know one question is is there somebody else out there that does this yeah and in, and you saw that in early childhood when mm -hmm. you know we're looking at partnering not where we're doing it but where we're putting seed money in and money in for our staff to take advantage of it because we don't have the capacity to do it but we can definitely facilitate it up to and being including me facilitating a conversation with building owners and other things and you know sort of bulldozing a path for some of these individuals to go through. But yeah, we couldn't take that on and do it. But what's interesting to me is, is that what looking around here and our staff and everything, the number of things that we really do, where when you look at other communities, what they, to Marsh's point, feel to have somewhat feel out to, to private uh, organizations. And what we actually have a say and have our our community members have a say in, uh, I think there's a lot of value to that. Uh, I I always find it interesting when when you hear this uh, when you hear people say, "Oh, don't polarize law and everything," but we're just we're, there's a perception of what Boulder is opposed to Longmont, and Longmont's the one actually doing all these things in the in the government realm where Boulder seems to have fielded out a lot of these things and yet yet they don't want that but yet they're supportive of that it's just so confusing to, to understand why uh, why that, that that would be the case there but it's almost like they they have a disconnect to what's really happening in Longmont and what has happened in Longmont and why Longmont is in such a position to have great water to have its own electricity to have its own uh, next slide type of system and all the other things that go along with and part of that is it's amazing how much they we have a say as community members in Longmont because of the way we conduct our business and ourselves and everything so what's interesting also is to see uh, you know how we're addressing these problems because you know Boulder is isn't really doing anything to fix their housing problem and uh, and in conversations with the, with the consortium of cities some of the council members there the things they want to focus on are are just reflect the fact they don't have that sort of uh, 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 control over things where the community says you will serve as a city council person here and you will help uh, you know the city manager you know direct staff to go in a particular direction or another they don't have that so then they come up with little things that seem to be really important on what seems to be like a social media issue but not what is really important to the citizens of Longmont I mean of their community and it's just kind of remarkable because we have such a unique situation such a different situation but they're they're uh, I think you know the fact that you're I like what you see here, giving you some feedback, and uh, and I respect where it's going because I understand it has to go that way, and I think uh, for the most part, and we do have these pressing issues around housing and, and staffing and how to, how to bring in good quality people to fill our positions as we grow. So it's just, it's all kind of very interesting to see the comparison, and I know my colleagues, Huge number from Boulder Valley don't live 
in Boulder Valley School District. We live in the same brain. Yeah. As a side note, um, our staffing levels, just to plug, and you can point out to them, are dramatically lower than the staffing levels in Boulder and Fort Collins and the other communities. Um, we were hoping to build a slide, they just had finished the, still the study. <laughs> they're, they're still doing the study, but it's not uncommon in, in, to see a department that is 5, 10, 15 plus. There's, there's double the ETS department and right. double the HR department, I know right. that for a fact. Yeah. yeah. Encouragement for the staff, I think. Uh, this came up when, when the Boulder was running its last city council election. And of course, the news want to have meetings with, with people in other cities. So they came up to Longmont and talked with some of us. And they see Longmont as being the leader because, well, because they, well, but they do. You know, <coughs> you hear that back there? They see Longmont as being the leader because we do, we can still solve our housing problem. We, we don't have the water problem that they have. They, you know, all of that stuff, they would like to be able to exercise the kind of foresight that has been Longmont's achievement for the last 34 years. So just, guys, do a good job. So to the uh, comments that they made, are there things <coughs> in the city that you can off the staff's plate, for example, when we use rhythm on the river, is what is the nexus between staff dollars and time versus having a third party do it? Um, um, because if you get rid of it, then that affects somewhat the quality of life that mm -hmm. people really look forward to. I think, for that. Yeah. I think it's looking. I think it's looking at the how. I think rhythm is a, is a really good example because you know what we saw. We sort of had two weeks of really hard times because we had 4th of July and we had rhythm within a week of each other. Mm -hmm. And we were absolutely killing our police department mm -hmm. because of overtime. And so I know I've, what is Friesner? I've continually said to Friesner, look at this in a different way. And so they're looking at shifting the day. We've got more conversations, but you know, what I threw out to Mariah giving them is, because I think they looked at moving into September 16th, and I started thinking, well, man, I don't know if this has gotten to you, Jeff. I know I've said it to some people. Wouldn't it be really good to actually move it to that date, which is around the flood? We then have some separation in terms of the impact, but we also use it to recognize the recovery that we've gone through and, and really how the river is different today and how it's safer for the community to really attach some things and it could, but that's what they have to work on the question then is is it a lot of staff it is a ton of staff that have to do it and, and that's where we have to maybe be a little more creative to go there's kind of an example around that so rhythm on the river is, is one thing right and right. staff budgets for it and we all sign for it mm -hmm. um, you know but what we start to get is lots of requests from the folks. Can you help us with this event? <laughs> it's a very case for that event. Can you do this thing over here? And before you know it, staff is then pulled in so many directions. Mark and direction and bring you a policy asking about how do we create city sponsored events that are determined by the city council? Because no staff wants to say no, of course, to those. And yet at the same time, there's no, there's you know, the policy doesn't totally enforce that. Um, and so, you know, certainly rhythm is one big event that we can look at. But my encouragement would be it's, it's more of the pulling of staff from other areas and entities, not just around events, but around all kinds of issues. So exactly. we'll be bringing a new policy to, to consider. And what we're hoping is that we'll just say, these are the events that we support. And if somebody wants to bring a new one, they can counsel make that decision based on all of these things, um, rather than us trying to help everybody get pulled into some of these different areas. There is a sense of brilliance to actually thinking about September 16th yes. because there's a huge number of folks coming from other communities up to Estes at that time for that Highland Festival, which would come through and go, oh my God, I had no idea that was going on here, and would make that part of their weekend plans uh, to do one and then to another. So there is some smart. And we have a council member that has an event around. Mm -hmm. That time. Juneteenth. Yeah. Or no, or what am I, I'm thinking of a different place. 
thinking of September 16th, which is different. It is. It's uh, that's extended. Yeah. Yes. But you, you know, but you have. Do you want me to have an event? But just tell me, Harold. <laughs> but think about it. So you have you have June 8th, you have Fourth of July. Rhythm on the River sort of overlaps in that. You know, then we're moving to this, and how do we? We have Cinco de Mayo, which is in May. So we have May, June, July. You know, if we can slide and move. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really want an Irish uh, Irish Irish Saint Patrick's, yeah. Oh, well, that's all over there. Do you want me to break? Yes. Yes. Before we break, could you back up one more? Uh, go, go. Yeah, yeah. You're going to right there. Um, the third bullet uh, under the heading of accountability: uh, defined goals and measurable outcomes. If I take that bullet and, and then pull it to the next slide, right? you know what? I would be totally satisfied to embrace goals with measurable outcomes around what's on that list, right? That, that you've said are your priorities, and, and however that gets refined, and then post them somewhere in council chambers. And, and every time we get a packet, so that every time there's a request to do something else, I can ask the question, how does this contribute to that? And if it doesn't, it's a non-starter. I'd listen, maybe help connect somebody with somebody else to find a solution. But, but it would be help, I, that would be a way to use what you said as priorities that are aspirational, and, and then to some degree operational as well. I mean, it kind of cuts across all the levels of the pyramid. Um, if those could be translated into the kind of goals that, I, that we could look at and answer the question pretty quickly, how does this get us to those outcomes? <coughs> As just a way to create some discipline for us when the requests come through. Or when, this, when you get them from the staff, or the staff gets them from the community. And, and, and that could, that's why we wanted to do this, because we knew that there was probably going to be an overlap in, from today until tomorrow. And, and if council said, we're still com where's the other presentation? The other one, can you bring it up? Are you ready for that? I wanted to clarify one thing from the last session. You know, when we talked about these are my operational goals. Um, there are others in here, but this is front and center in my mind. There's efficient, effective operations. There's adjusting to the world. These are the goals that I have extrapolated out of what you all put in here and said, this is what we're trying to absorb within the structure. Um, you all have a document that has um, a list of these. I don't have it in front of me. I'm not going to spend time going over it. It's just a PowerPoint where I would basically just read. And so you all can look at that. Um, I'm going to take advantage of what you all talked about just now and kind of move into tomorrow um, in terms of, and if anybody disagrees, let me know. But it was really, you know, I would take these and really sit out and how we break those down and what we work on in the future. That's part of what we're going to talk about tomorrow. Um, Sandy, can you change the... And I wanted to take advantage of time, so we finish, I finished much earlier than we had allocated, um, but I'm going to take that time. So first, Erica gave you uh, this. Do you see these? Um, and so this is cheesy. I'll admit it's really cheesy what I'm about to say. But how do you light the future with laser focus? Oh. <laughs> it is cheesy, <laughs> but when you have this pan and you keep it with you, and we're and you know we're asking about it, and you just shine it and go, you know, are, do we have laser focus? Should we use this on council? You can. Should we not? So 
you know, what we were talking about is what, what we were going to talk about, you know, when we set goals, you know, what's the long-term vision and the short-term motivation? How are we rowing in the same direction? How are we able to execute faster and better with greater accountability? How do we know when we reach success? We've, we've really talked about this in, internally. We get so caught up. And you heard people say this this morning in the tyranny of the moment and what we have to do. We never really get to celebrate success because we finish and we go. We finish and we go. And I think it's important to celebrate success. It's also important to celebrate failure. We may fail at something. And I think as an organization, we need to do a better job of celebrating failure because that's the only way you move forward. And I think at times, and I'm talking internally, we get afraid of failure and we don't want to make mistakes, that's an inherent part of moving forward, is failure and mistakes. If you just do the same thing, I've said this, if you just keep doing the same thing because we've always done it, how are we taking ourselves forward as an organization? We're not. And in the meantime, what's happened is the world's passed us by. And now we're trying to catch up to the world. Um, and, you know, it, it, we talk about eliminates the temptation of distractions. It's, it, it's interesting for me. I've heard you, when I was asking you all questions, I heard you all touch on this. I heard you actually touch on it this morning. Um, and so what you, if you looked at me when you were all going through your sessions, I was listening to try to catch everything you all were saying. But where you all came up with the same point was when you were talking to Sal, and the conversation was the, the squirrel button or whatever it was. He talked about how teams have the squirrel button. And they said, you know, who does that? And I think you all looked at Aaron and said that, you know, Aaron's the one that kind of goes, here's the piece. You know, that's what we're really talking about here because that's what starts eating capacity. Or it takes capacity and then we can't get other things done. Um, we were going to start tomorrow morning with the slide I left you. And, and on these issues to go, what do you think? Where do you want to go? And I want to spend a, a few minutes on this to really take off on what Council Member Water said and, and how he described how he would approach this and, and really get a sense from you all of how do you see us moving forward? Do you want to work on these? Do you want to focus on this? What do you see in that conversation coming tomorrow? Turn it over to you all. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I mean, did you all agree with what Tim said yeah. in terms yeah. of focusing on this and really setting those points out and setting the time limits? Mm -hmm. So I'll start. Did you agree with it? Oh, I think no, I had the mouth open, but all over. <laughs> <laughs> not the same one. So, uh, you know, just going through the four blue, three blue ones up there. The first one, providing pre-K learning opportunities. I do feel that we are focusing on that already and supporting the knowledgeable people who may have done a lot of work on this, supporting their efforts. And I heard you say, Carol, that you were working with Matt Aldrin in a, in a sense of how can we build to house the employees, uh, not house, but Put them in uh, care and pre-K as well. Um, so I do think we're supporting them, but they are doing the lion's share of the work. Right. And, and so I think that is number one should be. Um, and going to the next one, provide housing and supported services, unhoused population. Um, are you going to come to council at some point with our Apollo Village? <laughs> yeah, we we will. We're. Um... And, and it isn't a priority right now, I get that. But a vision and how we are addressing this. Yep. And that's part of the diverse housing stock. You actually see it in two places. A2, um, the A's and B's. Let me, let me fast forward. So you all had people in places. And, and when you all laid out your vision, and Valerie, that's how you put that in, correct? A is people, B is places. Things that you all put in those categories. Just to, um, but A, you see housing in two different I locations. Do, yeah. yeah. So for me, I think that those are all priorities and we're working on them and have been for two or three years, to be honest. Um, 
I think, okay, this is just not an option. I think those three have got to be the priority until we're at a point where they, we say we, we are well into it and there. More work needs to be done, but they don't want the priority <coughs> that we can go on to something else. Does that make sense? On, uh, on D1 there, uh, that that doesn't have to be completely associated with the presentation we got the other day. Does it? It's not tied in. Uh, your your vision of, of this doesn't have to necessarily be tied into that strictly that that program that. That presentation so much as as it's a goal for the community to reach that right. So this is a, a little different in what we're talking. About, one of the things that we're talking about. So what we know from a labor perspective, child care is becoming more and more important to hire folks. Council has been allocating money to the early childhood initiatives and how we look at it. Um, even in this this budget, I think we allocated 125,000 ongoing for child care. This is really focusing on something they want to do to create a large facility that provides child care, trains child care providers, and does other things of which we would put money into that to then try to get a reduced rate for our employees, but it still facilitates the creation of that. It's the same group, but it's a different project. Okay. Yeah, just or it's a similar person in a different project. It's not necessarily the same group. I don't interact with that. Everybody is that big, 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 big uh, picture concept. I'm, I'm still figuring my position on that. No, this is more. How do we support those things? So um, that project. I think what you heard in the presentation is a different question. Okay. And 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 it's interesting in that. You know, that's one of those things where you sit. It's really the county, you know, when you listen to the presentation, it's really the county commissioners that place that on the ballot. Um, there's really not a council action associated with that. But we can support it. Or, or not support it. Yes, you can. That's your choice as whether you want to support it, but in terms of the uh, uh, actions that are going to be taken, and I'm looking to Tim because he's more involved in it, it is the county commissioner. Yes. Actually, it's the judge. The yes. county commissioners have to approve a service plan and financial right. plan, but it's the judge who right. directs the county clerk. Yeah, I was just uh, say that, that even though these are now five years old, you know, these these priorities and these pri these focuses because they're not that different from one another, uh, and given our existing talk about organization. Absolutely. Um, I think these are still the right items. And yes, the, the, the blue ones at the top may be the highest priority, but I also think that that the, the B items, which are only Bs, it's not like A comes before right, B. Right. Uh, but <laughs> but these these things sustain the main priorities. So, as, as Harold was saying, we might we might draw some of them out longer, but I don't think any of these are in the category of we, we need to stop doing it. Right. I do think that we probably shouldn't try too hard to think up new things to start. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so just a quick question. When you were speaking earlier and talked about how do we, I think it was on one of the other slides, on the other presentation, how do we know that we're successful? That's, you know, the end result. We can say we're working on core, um, focusing on core services forever, but how do we know we are successful in that area? Because core services, we know that we are, is priority, right? Um, because that's the people. And, um, and, and, and that's where it, everything kind of trickles down back to that. But how do we know with everything else, with providing pre-K learning opportunities, what does that look like? And 
does that mean we have a facility for our city employees for their for their children? Then we're successful. Does that mean we just check that off then? Or how long do we work on it? Are we just providing funding for our employees so that they can have for their um, for their children? So you know, I just I think when we have those goals and everything, when you integrate that, what uh, Tim was talking about, I want. To, you know, I would like to know too, what does success look like for you all and for us? You know, and do we like, oh yeah, it would be amazing if we had our own facility, you know? Because you know, like in Texas, the IRS in Austin have a whole facility on the grounds just for their employees for daycare. Is that something we're talking about? Or are we just talking about providing financial means for I think we're talking about a hybrid version of it where we provide financials to the one one solution. There's probably many more, but we provide a facility by putting the financials into it that has an access point for our staff. So it's a bit of both. But I think that's really I don't want to take Tim's I don't want to you know misrepresent your words. I think that's the work that he was saying. One, he goes, what, why don't we do this? Because it is answering those questions of parameters, benchmarks, what success. And I guess that's the question. Do we want to go into that work looking at what's on the left and what's over here? We, we in, in software development, we always say, what's the definition of done? This, we don't have a definition of done. You know, um, when NetSlide became the fastest uh, internet, give or take, um, that any municipality could offer, that was a success. But it wasn't done because we had unmet needs. We didn't, we have, you know, we, we, we could not provide free services to the neediest people. Well, now we can, or nearly free services. and. You know, Valerie's predecessor said, can't be done. So there's always another success in front of it. And when something aspirational um, like Next Light was all the way at the apex, and now it's all the way down at the bottom, it's just another, not just another, but city utility. It's a city utility. <coughs> People would feel that they had lost something if they lost that. So we have to keep making sure that we have a new measure year by year. So, well, right, most of our core services are never done right. because to the point of, well, we need to be in continuous improvement, but to the point of the legislative impacts, they're constantly, constantly layering new things that we have to do. If you look at water and wastewater, it's like every year, there's a new standard we have to meet. So you're constantly done. Maybe it's what's done this year, but what's done three what's done year five and it's going to evolve as the world shifts around us so um instead of done that, that's a good point Marcia. we set benchmarks and did we make the benchmark this year i think putting quarterly benchmarks is way too much uh, on staff but i would like to know what have we what have we addressed since we first put that out there as the work plan, uh, and then what what do we think from staff's operational capacity? What do we think we can do this year, and what can we do next year? Not that we have to do that, but why can't we? And and one of the things I think that would interrupt that would be core uh, services. That this happened, so we have to put that on the back burner. For this. And I think that would be a good thing for all of us to know. When we go down on this to, like, for example, B4, I don't have any idea how we're doing that. You know, uh, ensuring high quality, that's what they're doing for us. These are just aspirations. You know, this is what we want to happen, but are we doing it and should we right now? Or is it just embedded in everything we do? Well, and that was one, that was probably. This one right here was related to Steve, and it was probably the one that was the most impacted by COVID. Because in COVID, the educational system shifted, everyone went remote, and now the educational systems at the higher ed is completely retooling how they 
approach it, but what we've done is we are still taking some of those principles as we work with Kimberly on some things she's looking at to go, how do you bring a, a different version of this? So as we look at downtown redevelopment, one of the things when we brought NDC in, um, and they have public-private partnership experts, there's a group of about 30 people. And the guy goes, well, how are you monetizing next life? I mean, what are you doing? And the question was not how do you monetize it on a stated basis, but how do you monetize it for a broader community benefit? Mm -hmm. So I know Valerie, because of the competitive state, wants a presence downtown because it's more visible as we're trying to compete with now at Verizon with the list of their 5G home offering. Why we're never done. Um, we said, well, what if, in order to bridge the gap, we could look at the possibility of putting commercial space on the ground floor of a housing project in downtown. Shakita heard a version of this when I was at the retreat. Um, gets the presence we need operationally. How do we then take the concept that I robbed um, from one of the presentations on um, the um, stadium money was the esports component because the value of that, from a monetary perspective, is huge, but have it located adjacent to next life. And then how do we build remote offices, classrooms that are fully teched out to where people can utilize that space for educational classes that are in an online platform? So we kind of threw this out as, well, this is an interesting opportunity because now you're monetizing at a different level. So didn't lose this. And then it just happened in the conversation as we're talking about this, one of the individuals that Kimberly's working with said, oh yeah, my buddy just started an esports program at University X. So now all of a sudden we're taking these concepts, attaching it to the goals that the DBA has, the goals that you all have for housing, and finding a way to monetize it and really build the capital stack. So we're, we're paying attention and trying to achieve it, but what we're building is what I think I would argue, and I'm not the, I'm not the educator in the room, is, is really the future of higher ed to where you can attend a Harvard class in the next like classroom. Mm -hmm. You can attend, and, and the, what I'm seeing for my kids is even though they one lives in the dorm, one lives here, most of their classes are now in a dual format. It's either online or in person, and you can just see the, the paradigm shifting. And, and so I think COVID changed a lot of this because we were talking to the CU, we were talking to these folks, and it just went exactly. poof. Yeah. So I think as we start, and, and we're jumping ahead to tomorrow. You know, this is what the council at the time established in terms of the vision and, and what you all, what they wanted to see. This is a different council. We wanted to start here with you all to go, has this changed? Is this what you want? Do you want to change it? Do you want something completely different? Because this will then start informing the next layers of the conversation. So now it's for you all to talk and interact with each other. Well, I think in the, in the very first sentence, I, I like our vision statement. I think it's great. What would be interesting to me is to, to tear it apart and see where we have actually done the things where we sit and where we go to be like, we're children are most fortunate to be born and raised. That would be education. That would be environment. That would be housing, health, and safety. And bullet point those ahead. Have we even addressed these things yet? <coughs> and on what level? And elders should support you in your entire life journey. That would be LHA. That would be, um, you know, us giving, sorry, we're not giving, but funding visa for them to get to where they need to go. That would be Sophia. And, um, 
but I think we need to have work that is uh, access to food, shelter. We need to do that. Wow, that was a... It would just, I don't know, it would just be a discussion about that. Have, have we addressed these things? And if so, in what way? And where are we on I think we continue to address them. So we had a big, uh, for example, access to food response during the early days of the COVID when that was totally dis disrupted. We may have even done more than was needed. I think, Susan, you brought up that in some cases the meals weren't being collected. Oh, what, at, at the schools? Or? Well, at, at the collection places that weren't at the schools, I think. But okay. Yeah. Would use lunch, which doesn't matter at this yeah. point. But if we're going to revisit some of these things, we can say, well, which of them are still relevant and which of them take a different form? We just had an example of that. Yeah, we're not going to get a university extension center, but next slide might provide one for people who don't have one at home, right? Don't have the right facilities at home, and don't have the capacity to do it their own. And, and, and that almost is, is, is a way to make it more like an educational experience again, because education traditionally didn't happen in the home cocoon. You know, it happened in the public square. So that's what we, we should be looking for, is where has the game changed so that maybe the details need to be adjusted, even though the large scale objective is not different. So when I said, have we addressed it, I was talking about we begin in our five years. This is our first time to really assess what we put up there and where we wanted to go. And you're right that in the, after we say, yes, we've addressed this, we've addressed this, we've addressed this, and now where do we go from here with them? Not, we're done. I'm not saying we've addressed in the past tense. Doesn't mean that we're done, but have we done this at all yet? And some of them may be less relevant. Exactly. In your full packet, you'll see the entire work plan mm -hmm. um, with all the progress that was made. But uh, we can show you up into these slides if Carol wants to share with you. There's a lot of ways for that. Those are the pyramids, those are the courses. Uh -huh. Sorry, these are the packets that were online. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, so there was a spreadsheet in there with there was a very oh, small font. Very small font. Yeah, yeah. lots of things happening. <laughs> and so we, uh, we boiled it down to this. I have copies of this yeah. on the Word version if you'd like us to run that. Yes. Yeah. Sandy, this is your summary of kind of what's the status right. yes based on what every relative to each of these is. goals mm -hmm. here, here it is in a word version if it's easier for you to look at so to some degree this is a response to what Joan was suggesting in terms right. of unpacking right. how, how far do we get in each of these things because I think you will find that some of them aren't as relevant and that yeah. some, of, some of them need a lot more yep focus or are way bigger than we thought way back in 2020. <laughs> Remember, you weren't even the housing authority for it back in 2020, right? Because you all had, I mean, if you look at the information they put in the packet, that was a really deep, a deep spreadsheet <laughs> with, with a, a lot of items <laughs> on it. <laughs> and so, so the summary is when we look at pre-K, um, you know, the, the, the first layer that we really had to go to is, um, and we used some of the money that Christina had allocated to this, is the contract with delivery and associates to, to measure early childhood services um, and, and really understand what is the gap. And I know they've done some work, delivery's doing it, that's going to be completed in April 2023. That was something that got caught up in COVID and everything else and what we're trying to do. You know, A12 is a great example. Of you all wanted to do some more focus on there's what uh, this is <coughs> that focus has changed and it's part of core services. Mm -hmm. So I would argue, for example, this is a goal that probably isn't as relevant anymore. It's been incorporated into core services. We do not to be the center mm -hmm. doing this work. And in contrast, A1, <coughs> A11, um, a, a couple of insights in terms of the work is to, to talk about three and four year olds is missing half the population we need to be attending part of. And so, we actually have a, a footnote to that is if we expand that to zero to five, that that um, completion deadline will be um, longer. Yeah. It, it'll be extended out, and we are exploring that with the TA. 
So it is zero to five. And then, you know, where you want to place your emphasis within that continuum, given that's, other things that have happened since then. And that's the kind of goal that you may want to update yeah. them, to say instead of three and four, which is where you all were at this yeah. time, that maybe you're saying you'd like for that to be zero to five. In this and, and I would say that there are things, you know, where that work started with thinking about when the city limits of long run, it didn't take long to expand beyond that because any solution that, would, that we were going to come up with for Longmont was going to be insufficient. It might be necessary, but insufficient for what needs to be done. It potentially was a problem for the St. Frank Valley School District. So we began to expand thinking and you know, it continued to grow. But that's, this, is not, this is not an either or exclusive. The fact is, if the alliance is successful, it just enhances everything else we do. It doesn't mean that there aren't things we do in addition to or parallel to or tangential to or in support of the alliance. I mean, however you want to think about that. I would make one other quick observation that you're all discussing at a time note. So we do have to be out of this room by 4.30. Um, but one thing I do want for you to know is rather than go through and update each of the lots of goals that are here, it may be good just to acknowledge what's been done in each of these areas and then set it aside. Look at the focus areas that you'd like to move in next and, and really re-look re because I'm afraid that if you update each of these individual single goals, you know, then you're going to miss the bigger picture to some extent. So we want you to see what's been accomplished in each of these areas, and then maybe start from Harold's list that, that comes from this to determine what does success look like in this next segment of time with these bigger spots. So I would I would encourage you not to micro update tiny goals. I feel like that's too too small for what you're. So I do want to throw out a couple of celebrations and you know just acknowledgements. So looking at the uh, delivering books to various schools and programs, um, there were not no anonymous here from the library, but um, we had a couple of um, library staff that came to our family literacy night at our school. They, you know, it was overwhelmingly popular. We expected like maybe a group of thirty kids. We ended up with uh, one hundred and fifty kids that showed up and their families and rounded them all up, put them in the center, and the, um, it was phenomenal staff, you know, read stories to them while, you know, the literacy teachers were able to, to conference with parents. Um, so it was very successful. We were able to have books to, to disseminate to families, so that was very um, popular, and I want to give kudos to the staff that came out and, and navigated that. <laughs> And the other one is looking at the next light services. Um, I had a student who new to the country. They're on free lunch, free reduced lunch, and they had no internet. So with the expectation of students are supposed to log on for snow days, well, we, are, we still have children that do not have access to internet. And so being able to, you know, immediately someone came out and, and hooked them up. So it was, you know, thank you. Well, when you look at this, you know, so this one, and even this one, they're, they're done, things. and we're now incorporating those in uh -huh. our core operations to see the move. Just fine-tuning them and tweaking them. This is not... You're saying that's a celebratory moment. You know, maybe that's kind of what we do with the rest of the time today, is look at these items so that you are aware of what happened to your direction from then and celebrate that. It's amazing work. A lot of work left on this. This we've accomplished a lot, mm -hmm. and and the paradigm to your point is drastically different in terms of what is accessible to the youth in our community, even older adults. Mm -hmm. When you look back at the vision you all had, they're they're doing the same thing for the older adults in bulk of green <coughs> properties, but we're not done, and it's continuing to evolve, and that's where you see this. We implemented it. Yeah. Exactly. Well, we implemented and we're and we're moving on some, but when you see this LTE wireless piece, we're expanding it, and we're expanding it for the students so they can have access anywhere. But we're also expanding it for us to utilize in terms of having that piece uh, where we can get some additional benefit out of it for the broader community. When you look at providing housing and support services. Um, you know, we're continuing to work on this. What um, the mayor talked about is um, Councilmember 
Doggo Ferry, the mayor, Molly, we went to look at the Dolores project, which was in Denver. I think you all were invited. And what it did is it started reframing how do we look at opportunities for the unhoused related to ARPA funds because what they've done is they've actually incorporated that within permanent supportive housing and affordable housing and what they're finding is it's actually increasing success in housing folks because they see people that they have been in um, a group setting with move into the different housing functions and they're working with them on the life skills that they need so they can be successful in the housing world. And so that's something that we've added into our list um, to short circuit it. You know, we're trying to get Element off the ground because Element is another big piece of this in terms of what is a, is a solution because we're building um, in May, we're going to start building 55 permanent supportive housing units which is a direct service to the unhoused. Most of the individuals that we pull into permanent supportive housing are unhoused individuals. And, and so, but it took us in the housing world two years to get to that point because of the financing work you have to go through, the development work. And so this year, construction's happening on one of these. Um, oops. Um, there's a lot of work daily on this um, home study program you know we always say it's easier to keep someone housed than it is to house someone that's unhoused and so the work that Carmen and her group that Molly and her group they're doing, they're, that's now core level work to where we're working to fund it we've, we've started we're evolving it's never going to be done is there a way that we can message about that more because people say um, there's all these houses there's all these homeless people um, and we could give them houses and you know the the flip of that is well, not, the, the people you see on the streets aren't those people we're keeping them housed um, and nobody understands that you know, they, they think that the people that they're seeing sleeping on the streets are the homesteady recipients, and they're, they're not. The homesteady recipients are not losing their housing. They may be better housing, but they're not losing what they've got. <coughs> and well, it would be great. It would, I think it would be a way of, of affecting the public mood if, there, if that could be um, popularized. Two points on that. One um, that I said to uh, Councilmember Rodriguez, and I think, I don't know if there are two or three of you sitting there, is A, I think we need to do a better job of getting you the information that you need so you can communicate to the, to, um, the residents of our community. Because that also gives you the tools that you need when you're forced to make a decision of can we do this or can we not do this. You can go, well, we can't do this because here's everything that we have going on. And it also answers the questions. And so that's work on our end that we have to do uh, to get that to you. Uh, I would be careful because there are people that are in the programs that lose their housing. And, um, you know, in the LHA world, we see that on a regular basis. And, um, and that gets into the Dolores house and why is that successful? Because um, it really is reteaching life skills. Harold, for me, if I think about when we were wherever we were in the fire station, mm -hmm. where we were doing, going through the conversation that got us these calls, if I think about where we are today versus where we are, where we were on May 20th, 2018, I think that was the day. Why would I remember that? Um, we have come so far. You know, we had a struggling housing authority at the time that started, you know, the proverbial circling of the pool uh, with, with very few initiatives we could point to in terms of actual development. I mean, if I were to wipe the slate clean, I'd go right back to where you, where, where you had as a goal. And, and the goals for uh, relative to housing would be about, you know, what are the milestones in terms of the healthy Zinnia project and Mustang, is that the way we're still referring to it as Mustang? I mean, those would be the goals in my mind, along with Crystal, right? 
right? But bing, bing, bing. That makes it way more visible, explicit, right. actionable, measurable, and relevant, right? As opposed to these, which were more kind of, aspir they were aspirational, right. but we you couldn't point to much that was on the ground, you know, that we were actually, we actually had to measure our progress. So for me, it would be taking those off and going back and, and then flushing out what's the goal that's relevant, timely, you know, as specific as we, around what we know we've got on the, on, on the docket right now. That's where we need to put our energy. And, and you all have actually done a lot of heavy lifting on the housing side. And, and you actually did that in your dual role as housing authorities, commissioners, in that you have said that we want six properties developed in the next five years. What we can do is add to the project schedules as in the end what that looks like. But you've done a lot of that work um, with your other hat on. That was a, a question that I heard from others, mostly housing advocates, not you know private citizens completely. Um, you know, it'd be great if the six developments in five years roadmap were somewhere easier to find because it's not out there, and um, that'd be a small amount of work that would, I, I think have a lot of mileage, get us a lot of mileage with the public. That's a good idea, actually. If we could have like some posters with our work plan and then under it, what we've accomplished um, in the civic city somewhere, maybe in the uh, forum right before, as people go into city council for 25 years. Mm -hmm. So when they say, what have you done? I said, what have you done? Yeah. Great posters. I don't have time. And some cheat sheets for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, you know, for whatever it's worth, uh, Ken Moore, Canada, their whole approach to their annual report is to be really clear. This is what we said we were going to do this year. Right. This is how close we came. And either check the box or here's what we learned mm -hmm. and what you can expect from us going forward. I mean, it's really simple. Right. It's not a lot of narrative. It is, um, but it's really clear in terms of what people could expect from us. And, and the things that we will never finish, just the ongoing, like the college um, investment of the children and uh, the mayor's book club or the city council book club, ongoing. You know, it's not done, it'll never be done. The same with houses and homelessness. This is what we've done, but never be finished. Or, or if, if I could make a suggestion is, we just overtly say this is moving into core services. Because some of these are moving into core, and I think that starts tying the core services into your overall work plan. And, and it, those are things that you have to keep your eye on. And because what you will find as this evolves and continues to go, there will be things, I mean, we pointed three things out that are now in our core service. And then I think as we're thinking about core services, and what else we're looking at doing, we also have to be cognizant of what we have absorbed out of these aspirational goals. Mm -hmm. um, because that's the tension. It is the tension, but I guess I'm thinking of advertising council, you know, and saying, this was our work plan we said in 2018, where are we in just short little bullet points. Sure. We've done this, 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 this. You yeah. should absolutely be armed with that information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because uh, we're not. Well, and what you're doing now, so to understand how this all works, what you're saying is now retooling my goals and how I'm looking at well, where do we need to focus our communication resources next year. How that's going to start translating then is I'm going to look at these folks right. and go, here's where we're going to focus. And so there may be things that. David wants to do, or Friesner wants to do, that I may have, I will be making real time adjustments yeah. in to get some of this stuff done. And that's actually a great way for me to see, this is, talk to you all about how I take what you're doing, then what I have to go back and work with this group on, plus Joey, and then they have to work with their group to make sure we're maximizing the efficiencies that we have in the system, and we're stopping and it would be a much easier conversation for us to have with the residents. Yes. You know, that we're all, we may not always agree with the way it's going, but we are 
if you don't communicate. And that has always been a difficult question. Trying to say that is something you don't know what we're saying yes to. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So we can keep, you know, we can go through this. This is a distilled version of, um, you know, when you look at um, vulnerable populations, you know, I'll talk a little bit about this. So we added the fourth core team in the budget process. Zach has actually retooled the core team a little bit where he's pulling some people to people's that. So it's actually our community health and James are our lead team. So we've reassigned uh, two of those uh, case managers to work nothing but specifically with our house population. Uh, we really feel that in order to take an aggressive approach of trying to, to help individuals to, to get them where they need to be, that we really need a lot of one on one case manager determine and identify what their needs are. And then from there, what services do we have? What services already exist in the county? And, um, and then how can we begin to partner with other uh, either nonprofits or other groups we already have relationships with um, to, to really begin to identify the needs so that we can move them into the other piece, which is and I always get the acronym wrong, it's HSBC, is that right? Did they hear it right? So again, uh, continued conversations. Um, with them about their information and their data storage and how we can begin to continue to share that information so that they're not duplicating services for individuals. And then we can continue to make sure that when we run across an individual that may be receiving services in Boulder County or even in the city of Boulder, that we can reach back out to their case manager or reach out to their resources there. And so that is something that we started several months ago. Um, and so we expect to definitely be thinking about doing a lot more as it gets warmer. Um, and so it is something that, that we're piloting, piloting, and we're gonna see how that works. Our other case managers are still working with individuals with substance abuse and mental health issues. We're still working with them to get them plugged into resources. Um, but that's typically a lot of folks that we continue to see on a, a, a revolving basis that the core is dealing with. Um, and so again, those are the types of things that we're working on. So again, like I said, it's a pilot program where our health population to really address that concern in our community. So we'll hopefully have it in the next next year, maybe this time, have some real time information to share with you about hey, this is what we're seeing, is it working, it's not, we tweaked it, here's what we're doing. Um, but it's something like I said, we've only been running for a few months. So. And it's there's an interesting story in this, uh, in that it's taken us three or four years to break the data um, wall. Um, and I'll out myself on this one. Um, I had to I pitched a fit. I, 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 I meeting bombed something that they were on, and just pitched, just pitched, yeah, I did. I mean, and hey, just pitched. Me. Said, Here's the deal. And, and, and just pitched a fit and said, if we can't get this across this barrier, you're making me question uh, the viability of what we're doing because we're not working together. And Zach has been pitching fits and see. I mean, we all have been doing it, but it took us three, and we didn't control it. We didn't control the data set. We didn't have ownership of it. And so it took us a long time to get access to it. And with a few tantrums in, in, in the middle of it. And that's kind of what gets in the depth of some of these things. Is a, mo a lot of it we have no control over. And it's coercion, it's, you know, it's exhaustive conversations that we have to go through. Harold, I just I wanted to mention, because I don't think it's fair. I know it says public safety, there's a lot of us who are working with the They're all working with us to help address these, these questions and need because it's a bigger problem than just public safety. So when Harold talks about his model of excellence, it's probably not as robust as you saw for regular park and some other things, but it is taking the same principles and applying to other areas, whether it's working with David Bell and his group, whether it's working with whoever. Uh, it, is, it is a collective approach to trying to solve an issue within our community and how to address it. I think that there are some barriers in that, especially in the in the database area, that, that may be reckoned without. And, and I'm, I'm amazed to hear that you overcame it at all. Because Thank you. Christina, we worked on it. So <laughs> because because for our different agencies like Hope, it's a trust issue that they hold on to that. Mm -hmm. Right. They don't share. Right, so I want to, I want to address that because that was an issue that is really the conversation we had. Public safety, as far as like a police officer or a firefighter, doesn't have access to the database. It's our case managers who are not 
police officers because there was that fear of you're going to use it to, to arrest people and do all these things. So we specifically have set it up to build that level of trust. So I don't have access to it. Police officers don't have access to it. It's creating this group that is a part of the public safety, a part of the city, that wouldn't use it for, I guess, the concerns of maybe the community or for those individuals that we want to have. So it's a valid point that we were, that's what we worked around to be able to try to figure out how to share this data and I'm going to start winding it up for today. Uh, we did get a jump start for tomorrow, which is really good. I'm going to ask you all for, to do some homework. Uh, we're, we've got home, we've got homework after this, where we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to get together and reshuffle because you all made a lot of progress actually this afternoon. Um, but. That's another example when we talk about capacity issues. With Zach just gave the great explanation. It's not just him, you know, it's Christina, it's Eliberto, it's the, the, the social service group, it's Sandy, it's Joni, and you can see how when these things come, we pull pretty quickly to try to work through it. And, uh, and that's the one thing I wanted you to hear in this is that almost everything we're engaging in now as an organization is not one department because what we found is one department can't take this on our own. And we're not as successful as we could be when we bring everyone together in, in that center of excellence. The, the homework is, I know we've provided the, the overview to you all um, on this, which just mimics these slides. And, and we gave you, um, in your packet, you have more detailed sheets. And so if you all can look at that, so when we come in tomorrow, you know, I think that'll answer many of the questions in terms of what have we done and what have we accomplished. And then if what you all want to focus on is this in terms of, is this still consistent? Is this what you want? Do you want to adjust it? And then if we look off, and I don't have the slide here on this one, but the slide where I had here are my goals and here are your goals, and then we just start digging into that. I think that could really make for a pretty productive day, and um, I think it can help you all in timing too. Just, you know, I think we could move through that. So if, if, if you will indulge me and um, take the homework assignment, I think we can, we can move tomorrow and really hit some things that we know we can accomplish, um, get focused, and, and maybe even design it on a short, mid, long-term, three, five, seven-year piece, because some of these are seven to 10-year goals. Mm -hmm. And um, so. But Harold, is it fair to ask them to focus on what, not how, and focus on what does good look like? What is your vision for right. that outcome? So as tangible as out, of outcome as possible, then we'll figure out how to achieve that. But if you'll stay up here at the more strategic level, I think, well, and it, it's hard, right? Because you know, when we look at, I'll just give you an example. Hold that so I can some time. When we got into the affordable and attainable housing goals that you've given us, it is messy, and looking out for the unintended consequences and trying to pull all of this together, you're going to see in a, in, in, within a month um, some recommendations for attainable and affordable housing. It's taken us months to work through this because we'll literally get to a point where we go, ooh, there's a legal issue. Ooh, there's a fair housing issue. And, and then you have to back up and then you have to rework it again. And I think that's why Valerie's saying the what, not the how because there are so many regulatory roadblocks in this that even at times we don't know them and we come into them accidentally. Mm -hmm. Molly and I have learned so much via the housing authority in terms of what that means in the housing world and we never would have known it without actually getting into the housing authority. Mm -hmm. And so... So here what I hear you saying for tomorrow's agenda is that if everybody can take a look at the work plan update that we give you the word version that says here's everything we accomplished and think a little bit about the vision 
so then tomorrow morning we're going to start right there around affirming or changing the vision. Um, you're saying then to move right into the to the goals section and then come back to roadmaps, street renaming, um, conversation about density and building environment. Those are more info items, kind of. Yeah, I think. Well, I just don't want to lose the momentum you all have yeah. built. You all have really, whether you realize it or not, built a lot of momentum. And I think it's easier to go straight into that. But that's up to you all. This is your retreat. Does that, that, that work for you all? Yes, it is. Yeah. 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 So we have two people on the public side who want to be first. Who are you? Who is Okay, the first one is uh, Shaquille. Shaquille, why don't you come on over here to kind of the corner so that everybody can see you. Okay. Uh, Mayor and members of council, I'd like to bring up one of the greatest challenges facing the city that I know you're already completely aware of. The price of housing is too damn high. Um, I know that you are focused on this, and I want to bring up a few ideas that I think are, that are worth your consideration as you consider the strategic plan for Longmont's future. The only way to create more affordable and attainable housing is to build it. There are some short-term solutions out there, like rent control or building a 12-foot electrified fence around the city limits to keep people alive. <laughs> but actually solving the problem will require a long-term solution that is both financially and environmentally sustainable. While the city staff have made great strides since taking over the Longmont Housing Authority, the reality is that LHA alone cannot possibly fix the housing shortfall that we are facing. This is because of limitations both financial and logistical. And I'm not going to delve into the financial ones because I think that's already pretty well understood by the council. But the logistical challenges are real. By its very nature, a great deal of LHA energy goes towards big projects that can add a lot of units. That usually means land which already doesn't have something on it, and it makes it more expensive because of the cost of horizontal infrastructure. And every single project draws on staff resources. Big projects have another problem. They generate public resistance. I know you regularly hear from residents at, about, who are against adding 70 townhomes in Bone Farm or 150 units in your Champion Greens. There is a solution to this problem that requires no staff resources and no city financing. The solution is to change the rules to make it possible with, to build what's referred to as the missing middle in housing. The missing middle is so called because of its absence in most cities caused by the rules of construction and financing which preference either single-family detached housing or big apartment complexes on green fields. It's not totally missing in Longmont, but we need it to be more of the exception, or less of the exception and more of the rule. Missing middle housing takes land which has already been developed and makes incremental changes which simultaneously increase property values and decrease the price of housing. A single-family residence becomes a duplex. A big backyard will get an ADU. A deep corner lot gets a bespoke town it's environmentally sustainable because it doesn't consume any additional green space, and it results in housing that reduces per capita energy and water use. It's financially sustainable because the owners of the property have an incentive to do it. By definition, these are property improvements. They take existing properties and increase their value by splitting them into multiple saleable or rentable units. Because of the property investments, property tax revenues go up, which supports infrastructure investments. And because there are more homes on the same amount of land, the price of each unit is less than before, meaning the price of housing comes down. And because there's a private incentive to do it, it means that it consumes no staff resources and no part of the city budget. Because every project is small and bespoke, there's a lot less incentives for, or for neighborhoods to organize against these projects. And because there are more private landowners than city staff members, Small incremental changes will result in more housing units being built than LHA ever could. This is how cities have grown for millennia. It already works, we just need to enable it. The city of Longmont is blessed with intelligent, forward-thinking staff who know how to make this possible, and I believe want to do it. I beg you to ask them. There's also a growing base of residents interested in these ideas and how they can improve the quality of life, equity, and the environment. Some of us are organizing. We have specific ideas. Ask us how to help. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Huck Kwok. I live at 1272 Long Street Avenue. 
And I'm here once again to express my concern about the recently passed policy which prevents PDUs from being used as short-term rentals. Originally, my concern was about the policy itself, and I sought out the reasoning behind the policy. Now my concern has grown to include the fact that I've asked each of you numerous times for the reasoning behind this policy, and nobody has been able to provide a rational answer. The few answers that I have received fall into two categories. The first is that of preserving long-term affordable housing, and the second relates to behavioral concerns like noise, parking, trash, and smoking and heat. Let's examine each of these a bit. If the policy is aimed at preserving long-term housing, then we must realize that it is only preventing the extremely small fraction of dwellings that fall into that PDU category from leaving the long-term home. The vast majority of dwellings in Longmont are non-ADUs and, as such, are allowed to leave the long-term market for the short-term market. And indeed, they are leaving. As I've shared with all of you previously, more than 60 two-bedroom and larger homes were converted from long-term housing to short-term rentals last year. I do not advocate for any restrictions on STRs in a non-tourism-based city like Longmont. However, if there is to be any discrimination based on dwelling type, the restriction should be on the higher occupancy, more affordable, and much more prevalent single-family homes which are ideal for long-term housing. The data confirms what common sense suggests, which is that this policy is completely ineffective at preserving long-term housing in Longmont. Now, if the policy is aimed at minimizing behavioral impacts on the neighborhood, it is important to note that the type of dwelling guests are staying in has very little effect on their behavior. A bad guest behaves just as poorly in a three-bedroom, two-bath house on the corner as they do in a studio apartment in my backyard. In fact, they will likely behave worse than the former, whose higher occupancy makes it more conducive to parties, and whose owner does not live on site to monitor and address issues immediately. This policy clearly has no effect on the behavior of short-term guests coming to Long. Now, perhaps there is something I have missed. If so, it's not for lack of trying, and I welcome you to provide me with the information I have missed by responding to any one of the numerous emails I've sent each of you over the past four and a half months. But if I have not missed some, anything, then might I make a suggestion? Tomorrow, during the lightning round brainstorm session at 3 p.m., where you will be collecting ordinances that should be reviewed and modernized, add this one to your list. I am sure it is important to all of you to only have well thought out, effective, and enforceable policies on the books. It's time to remove this ineffective policy and treat ADUs like every other dwelling type with regards to short term rentals. And here, here with what this gentleman said, I totally agree with what he said. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So Mary, I'll take the emails for public advisory, but we did post it would be 4 30, so I'll stay around and make sure. Uh, but we do uh, actually and leave. Yeah, so tomorrow morning we'll have breakfast here at 8 30. We'll start at 9.